uh, great to have you here, Dylan and Nick and uh, Colin. And don't be nervous. I see Robert De Niro is part of the audience tonight. <laughs> so uh, could be uh, picking up a job after we finish this. <laughs> um, Fantastic. Colin, as uh, David just said, uh, the uh, film in a silent way began as a short film. I kind of watched them out of order. I watched the full length first and then sure. the short. And I wonder if you could talk about um, the changes you made to the from the short film into making it a full length. It seems like it's maybe a little bit darker. Yeah. Um, it's funny though. We actually, so our first, we wrote our first draft of the feature screenplay before we uh, did the short. And then we actually took the first 10 pages of that first draft and then we're like, let's make a short out of this. So our first draft, that short film is the first draft of the, of our, is, yeah, the first 10 pages of our first draft of this film. So obviously we made that and then we just went back and rewrote and rewrote. And I think we did like seven or eight other drafts, which like, you know, dramatically changed the film. Um, but it all kind of actually started with the idea of like, let's make a feature and then, oh, let's make a short to help make the feature, you know? And I definitely think this version, this feature version is, yeah, it's much more, it's, you know, there's a lot more detail and it's, you know, you get to explore the characters a lot more, which I love. And I think it's, you know, that short is like a great little starting point for us. And I think the feature is really expressive of, of where we wanted it to go, you know? Yeah. And uh, Nick Tuttle, uh, not only getting a producer and writing credits, but also an actor, both in the full length and the short film. Nick, I wonder if you can tell us about how the film was cast, because not only do uh, the actors have to act, they needed to be able to play some music too. Yeah, so that was a big thing with Colin. Um, uh, we had Lisa London um, casting and she does a lot of we were lucky. We, she does a lot of um, major films. She does a lot of the Adam Sandler films. And going into it, we knew, one, they kind of have to know the style and feel of, like, Christopher Guest films, some d kind of darker documentary films that we had noted in the uh, breakdowns. But they also, we were hoping that they knew some of their respective instruments. Um, and some did, some were pretty, pretty, uh, pretty quick to it, but we had rehearsals too for like, I don't know, call them maybe a week and a yeah. half of just. I think at least two weeks for sure. Yeah. And I would say too on that, you know, you get a lot of people coming in who are playing something for the sake of comedy. And that's really hard to, you know, sort of, you know get rid of in someone and so when you know we had people coming in it was really about the them playing it honestly and not as though oh this is a joke or like you know oh let me try and be funny here so that was a real you know kind of involved process you know that we had to go through trying to figure out who really honestly could deliver this you know material well, I think Nikolai Dorian delivered, uh, Colin. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what, a, what a character he is, uh, able to play the comedy roles. But certainly, I, you know, I spent a lot of that movie just feeling so sorry for the guy. Can you tell Good. us about uh, Nikolai and uh, how much of uh, his work was improvised versus scripted out? Yeah, uh, so it was great because we actually, in the process of evolving this thing, we tried to do it all improvised. And quickly realized it didn't work. It was not funny. It was like <laughs> all over the place, very like boring, crazy, all this stuff. So we wrote the script and really like got it to a really good place. And then on the day, it was just like, we know where we're going. So let's get that and then go with it. So I would say about 50% of what is in the movie is um, like improvised and 50% is... Uh, scripted you know and I think that's like a real testament to Dylan as well because Dylan really had to sort of go with whoever was going whoever was on in that moment you know and it was just kind of like trusting them to just get through it and you know provide um, so yeah I always like to say about 50 50 for improvisation and script 
And Dylan Dugas, uh, the director of photography, cinematographer, you really are another character in this movie. Dylan, the guy with the camera who's filming everything. And uh, I wonder if you could talk about how that was different from a normal uh, filming operation. I mean, you must have felt like you were part of the action there. You really were. Yeah, I've, <clears throat> excuse me, I've shot um, a few documentaries before. And that was really just the approach that I took where I just tried to place myself in my own shoes in the past shooting documentaries where you don't know what's going to happen. And so obviously I've read the script, but I would sort of just try and forget the script as any of the actors would, and then just try and film what was happening spontaneously. Um, and it was a lot of fun. I mean, it, you know, there's a lot of threads that were, um, acted out that aren't in the movie that where the scenes just keep going and going and going and going and they go down the street and up the road and you know and so it, it's it's fun and but it is it's a lot like just shooting a real documentary um you know typically you'll you know set up a shot and then you do multiple takes and then you set up a new angle and um you know one of the things colin and i had talked about a lot was that we had to be able to shoot it in a way where obviously we knew we were going to cut things up, but we had to be able to do it in a linear way where it didn't seem like uh, there were two cameras because it wasn't a situation in like the office where there are multiple cameras and that's part of the shtick. Mm -hmm. This is our shtick was that there's only one camera. And so we had to really, um, that, that was something we had to always be aware of, was that if we're gonna cut from here, you know, we have to do it, we have to move the camera in a way where it looks like a time jump, not just a spatial jump. Um, so that was, the th you know, the things that were just always going through my head. Now, in making a, this kind of movie, which is largely improvised, partially scripted, um, but in a kind of a Spinal Tap office way, both of those uh, creations uh, were really, um, generated some great iconic lines and uh, there are a few iconic lines in this film that i think could live on for a while one of my favorites is um try it more humble not so fully yourself there's a <laughs> great great line in there i think musicians will be repeating that for years or uh, just indulge me is one of my favorite lines too i wonder if you guys have any favorite lines from the film nick uh, as an actor of the film are there any of your favorites oh man um I think some of the ones that Nikolai were saying when he was having that meltdown in uh, in his bedroom. I think we just re we just rewatched this last week, and that whole. I mean, when we shot that, it took like thirty minutes of just one take, and there were some in there like this, like this is my heart. You see that, and it's it's bleeding right there. Or like he was like smacking up against the wall with He's it, painting on the wall, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Dylan, do you have any favorite lines uh, that you captured and had to not laugh while you were filming? Um, I, I, don't, I don't know if a line specifically, but a lot of the stuff with Tate McDuffie I thought was was difficult to keep it together with. There's one when when Jazzin first comes into the studio and uh, Tate is showing him around. And they're talking about, I don't even know who the jazz music, musician is that they're talking about, but he was a little kid when he was recording there and he had to bring him juice boxes. Julian Lodge. And, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and then uh, Jazzin tries to keep going with that and, and sort of flatter him. And he's <laughs> like, oh, is this the actual chair that he was sitting in? And Tape's just like, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know that, that kills me. Yeah. Colin, do you have any favorite lines from the film? I love, um, Nick has a great line that he improvised where he <laughs> says, uh, you think it's, I think he goes, it's, it's, you think it's all peaches and cream. And he goes, it's not, it's peaches and shit. And I just <laughs> love that line. And I think it's, it makes me laugh every time. Um, I think that's so funny. And then, you know, I think the whole, the whole like beginning monologue of jazz and always, uh, there's something about it where I just like always, cracks me up so yeah now you guys are all down around the los angeles area la's jazz scene has been really on the come up in the last decade or so and i wonder if you guys are actual jazz fans are you familiar with the jazz musicians down there 
Colin? Was it a matter of calling out to all your jazz musician friends or did you have to do some searching? We definitely had to do some searching. Again, like uh, Nikolai, I don't know how, I don't remember how, but he was in touch with uh, an artist uh, named Zephyr Avalon and Balam Garcia. I actually think one of them was his actual um, teacher and like his guitar teacher. And so they had a little library of tunes, um, you know, and they're LA based musicians. And so we sort of took from them, you know, a lot of the songs are from them. And then obviously like one of our favorite, favorite guys is Bob Reynolds, who's out here, who we've seen at the Baked Potato like so many times. And he's like a, I mean, we would go there and like just, uh, he's, we love him. And so we were able to use one of his songs for the movie as well. Um, so yeah, we're like, we definitely, there was some searching and, you know, pleading definitely with people. Uh, but yeah, you know, we love, I mean, when things were more normal, we, we took many a trips to the baked potato, you know? So I would say we're familiar, you know, no, no experts, but familiar for sure. I would like to say I'm not familiar at all, but we, you know, Colin took me to the baked potato because I wanted to get a vibe for it, especially because we had a couple of scenes there. So yeah. I really wanted to see what it was like. And, and to be honest, it was much different than what I thought. Um, it was, it was much more chill and, and, um, it, it just wasn't what I was expecting. It's not the vibe you have at a bar. It's not the vibe you have at, you know, certainly a rock concert. So it is a very specific vibe that was super helpful for me to have experienced mm -hmm. that before going in and shooting those scenes. Yeah. yeah, and for those of the, uh, those of you who uh, haven't been to Los Angeles or haven't been to the Baked Potato, that is a real jazz club. It is a legendary jazz club. Lee Rittenauer, Dave Grusin. Yeah. Uh, that's where all the hip cats play. Um, Nick, I wonder, as uh, a musician yourself, if, if you felt any of that kind of vibe of the jazz greats in there, or did it just seem like a divey club where you're making a movie? Um, uh, sorry, I'm laughing. It just, uh, I, <laughs> I, I'm not a musician at all. Nick. Oh wow! All the well done. You're a fine actor then. That's a lot of Colin's uh, Colin's touches there. Um, yeah. No, I, I I while we were writing it, we went to the baked potato. I think three times, two two or three times. And, and I definitely I was like, this is I I've been to tons of non jazz um, kind of bars, clubs, things like that, and it's just it's a completely different scene so for me i actually kind of got an appreciation for jazz as we were going through with writing it yeah um and i think too it's like with i'm glad you believe nick because this was something you know yeah. you when you think of jazz you like don't realize well you do i mean but some don't realize the like technicality and the precision of being a like a very good jazz musician and even somebody who's not you know, legendary, who's maybe in college or something like that, you don't realize how talented these guys are and like what they can do is often very difficult to mimic. So that was something, you know, we went into this and I knew I was like, it's going to be hard to, you know, get guys who are not professional jazz musicians to then fake being real, like professional, you know, jazz musicians. So I'm glad, I'm glad it worked. I'm glad that you, I'm glad that Nick yeah. got away with it, you know, and <laughs> he did a lot of, you did get a sax, didn't you, Nick? Yeah, I mean, I rented a sax. I worked, I worked my ass off, I, but yeah. no, I, no, not really. I learned like scales oh, wow. on a saxophone. You did, you did right work, I think. A couple, or, I, I practiced for like two, three weeks, pretty, pretty hard, but I, I mean, jazz isn't even, it, it's like going from scales to anything with jazz is not. I, yeah, I probably needed like six years yeah. to get anywhere near what I was even doing in the film. Yeah, learning um, to play jazz is very, very difficult. Uh, learning about the cliches of jazz is a little bit easier. Sure. I wonder if you could talk about some of the cliches of jazz uh, we saw in the film. Uh, Colin, uh, the live uh, concert, the house party at the very beginning, I thought was a lot of fun just to show what a, what a jazz audience is like. Oh, yeah. I mean... <sighs> It's funny because I didn't even, you know, we kind of went into it and we knew like, I respond to jazz in a very different way than I think other people respond to jazz. And I think 
it's interesting to see the difference of how some people react in this way of like groove and like their body moves and it's like this feeling that goes up and out of them and then some people are just like what do you mean you know they don't they're like okay yeah it's it's fine and i think it's like definitely tried to have that in there and then obviously with the free jazz that they go into which is just like the not good at all you know i think that is just it's so um cliche of 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 young i think inexperienced musicians maybe who think that like that's like they should skip everything and go straight to the straight to the like bitches brew straight to the you know like uh sort of weather report jaco pastoria sort of uh, you know experimentation and i think that you know is obviously jazzin's whole thing right i mean that's his whole vibe is solidify me i'm i can do anything yeah uh Nick, I wonder if you have any uh, any uh, jazz um, cliches that you picked up for your performance as a musician in the uh, film. I mean, I was trying to learn the lick on the sax for like a good week or so. And we were trying to put that, we were trying to put that, like the biggest jazz cliche into it, that those those series of notes. But I, I think, I mean, we were humming that basically every single day on set. Basically, <laughs> we were all humming the lick and Dylan was d even doing it. Oh, yeah. Yes, that. that's true. Um, but we didn't, obviously we didn't put that in. But um, I don't know. I think the, the free jazz thing, because I've always been the person to walk around that, even though we've never really been to parties or any house shows. But going into some, whether it's playing in the background or anything, I've always been the person to kind of walk around and use it as a background. Um, but I think also the, uh, what was it, the... Um, Oh man, I can't. I can't remember it. But I, I, the the house show definitely for me at least. There was a couple other things that we wrote that were like, oh yeah, that's that's it. And I have but. to say too, Nick embodied this thing because at the very end show, he like walks on stage really cool and takes off his jacket really slow and then kind of slaps his butt. And we had musicians who after the fact were doing some recording for us and they were like, oh man, this is too much. I've seen this. I know this guy. I know this guy. Like, stop. So that was really great. That's like another, it's really, we love hearing that kind of stuff. And uh, Dylan, I wonder if you could talk about the challenges of working in a, a crowded room as far and uh, get into more details about um, adding the sound to the, the video, uh, the film that you shot in the, in the house party. Yeah, well, the biggest challenge was, um, was the fact that a lot of the musicians didn't actually play the instruments mm -hmm. to the level that we needed it to be. So you couldn't do super close ups on hands. Um, and you know in nick's case you know with the sax so it was a lot of trying to figure out how to keep it interesting and show what's happening but without giving away that so there's a few situations where like with nick at the baked potato at the end if you watch it there's a a, a note a note stand right in front of the saxophone for pretty much the whole performance um, and that's don't very give away the secrets, Dylan. Don't <laughs> give away the secrets. That's secret. what I was thinking as that's I was thinking. Yeah, don't give away the secrets. You just said I was good and believable. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But so you just try and do stuff like that to try and hide it. And, you know, you don't want to rely too much just on, like, going in on a close-up because an audience can tire of that. So yeah, just try and keep it interesting, like, keep moving it around. Um, the, the, at the baked potato at the end there, that one was particularly challenging because – it, it does happen in real time and you can't, we couldn't cut away from it, you know? Mm. So I couldn't, I couldn't for take two relocate somewhere else. It had to be there and it had to sort of play in one. So filming a whole performance like that where you can't cut away, it, it just becomes challenging to keep the frame interesting, you mm -hmm. know, because you know you can't cut away and you can't skip ahead like we normally can. And most of our cuts, can be a temporal cut, but with a performance, you need every every note yeah. that they're playing. So, yeah, it's just luckily we you know we settled on the zoom lens, which was nice, and so that really obviously helps reframing things. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, 
maybe I, I relied on the Zoom too much sometimes, but uh, yeah, you know, you just try and keep it interesting. I thought it was very effective. Uh, and another um, scene, the perspective of that camera, I thought was really effective in the, the stalking scenes where, <laughs> yeah. where Jason is sneaking up on his band who's playing with somebody else. Colin, I wonder if you could talk about uh, that idea of kind of being the, the stalker. Yeah. I, I mean, we just knew that he had to find out at some point that he was being betrayed. And we, of course, you know, the way he reacts to things is so uh, dramatic. It's so over the top, you know, and that was particularly fun for sure. And I think Dylan had fun with that too, sort of going commando, like, you know, really just following him, getting, getting in it. And um, yeah, I mean, that was really fun. We had another scene too that he, we had more stalking stuff that eventually had to get cut, you know, where he's in his, uh, what do you call it? His hospital gown with nothing under it, running away. Like we had crazy stuff, you know, and of course we have to cut stuff out, but that was, I, I just like, it was so fun. And I, in the first cuts of the film too, I had left the whole thing in because I just thought it was so silly and funny and like, just like, oh my god with the crawling on the grass and the sneaky and so yeah i mean uh you know i'm glad i'm really happy with how it is but that was fun and i mean dylan i think you had fun with that too if i remember yeah it was a lot of fun well again the challenge was that i have to remember that i'm as present as jasmine is so i i tried to move in a way where i was also hiding myself because i knew that i couldn't reveal myself to the characters inside the house. So I equally had to be um, sort of covert as Jazzin was. And doing that with a heavy camera is challenging, but it was, it was a lot of fun. Um, and Nikolai and I had a lot of fun doing that for sure. Now, not to give away the ending of the film, but it's a really smart ending. It kind of wraps up the whole kind of story of the film as less about jazz and more about obsession and delusion and that need for fame, which is kind of a recurring theme in uh, uh, films about Los Angeles. And I wonder if you could talk about uh, that, Colin, the, the whole yeah. kind of point of the movie. So I will say, like, we had written a different ending and shot a different ending. And obviously, it was, we showed it to people and sort of, as I you know, went through and was editing it, uh, it just didn't work. And actually our executive producer, Jim Cummings, when we showed it to him, he said he gave us sort of the, the you know, uh, like butt of the idea. And we then sort of went off and we're like, what can we do to make this? Because I think it is also about that delusion of somebody who gets into this thing and goes so hard and then, sort of is like, okay, well, it's not going my way. Wait, there's this other thing that I actually love more. But I also think in a way it's very uh, uplifting because I think it's not like he failed. It's like he is like, oh, it's okay. And I think there's something really powerful about that uh, idea of like, not that he, you know, yes, he fucked everything up, but that in his mind, he's like, well, it's okay. I have another thing and it's this thing. And, you know, that was something that we sort of developed and obviously what's in the movie was sort of, you know, not to give it all away with, with what he's wearing and everything was actually Nikolai was getting into that. And so he was like, I want to do this. And I was like, let's do it. And so he had a buddy who had all the equipment. And so we just got it all. And that ended up being the thing that worked like perfectly. And, and that, 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 oh, yeah, sorry. go ahead, Nick. That is one, that ending is the one part where when we've shown it to like jazz musicians or at least even people in the arts overall, that obsession factor where he doesn't quite give up and he's not failed on it, but he goes on to something else. That part resonated mostly to people. Like that part mm -hmm. where you kind of at the end of it, you root for him. So you don't really want him to be a failure but yeah. you want him to at least have that same passion and jazz that he does in something else. That part, I would say, even for me, I was like, I mean, I'm, I'm, I can deal with that. Like I'm happy with that because in the beginning of it, a lot of people too, they see the first 20 minutes and they're like, I can't, I can't with this guy. Like he is just too either annoying or 
self-centered and it a hundred percent is but by the time you get through it you kind of feel for him and i just thought yeah i thought i thought it was a great ending and colin colin i thought colin mostly came up with it and i thought it was a great way to tie it yeah. off and just finish her up yeah we yeah that'll be the incentive all of you viewers out there if you haven't seen the movie watch it and if you have tell your friends about it it's uh streaming through thursday at the tacoma film festival um, director of photography Dylan Dugas, uh, producer, writer, actor Nick Tuttle, director, writer Colin Levine. Thank you all uh, for being here. One last question. Um, there have been a slew of terrific jazz documentaries, music documentaries, and I wonder if you could tell us about if you have any favorite movies about music or uh, documentaries about music or favorite documentaries. Um, Dylan, we'll begin with you. Yeah, I just watched um, on the Criterion channel, I watched. Uh, so one of my favorite uh, cinema verite documentary filmmakers, D.A. Pennebaker. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, he's like the, the grandfather of cinema verite. Um, I saw, it's called, um, oh, I can't remember what it's called. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> but it's, uh, uh, it's a Broadway, I'm sorry, there's a Broadway show and they're recording the album um cast some cast album maybe they're recording the album so it's all of the performers um recording it and he got access to film it and it was like a 16 hour um recording session and it's awesome and uh it, it, it it's it's totally in his style of all of his other cinema verite um company uh company cast album i think it's called something like that and, original uh, cast album company thank you yes thank you internet <laughs> yes um, <laughs> and it's, awesome. it's really great it's only like an hour long um and it, it, it's super awesome yeah nick do you have a favorite music film or a uh, documentary i mean i, I I'm, I'm not the most uh, educated on documentaries and i'm kind of partial i was i was working at a movie theater when whiplash came out so oh. i watched that probably 13 times i'm not saying it's the best but I think it, I, I definitely love that film. It's not, it's definitely not the best, uh, most educated jazz films, but I, I think it's one of the, my favorite artistic music uh, journey film. And Colin. Yeah, I will say I, jazz documentaries, the one that I watched most recently that I loved was Jocko, mm. obviously. And that's a oh, great yeah. documentary. I think, you know, I think we showed it to the cast maybe before as before all this as well. Um, I love that. And uh, as far as like the documentaries that really inspired this are uh, like American movie. And there's a director called uh, named Alan King that was like a an amazing documentary cinema, cinema verite director. And he was, you know, I always was told Dylan, I was like, this is what we're doing. You know, we're trying to, trying, you know, who knows if we succeeded, but that was always sort of the goal was to do something that was felt as honest and real, you know, as, as what he had, had, has done. So, yeah. Thanks again, Colin. Thank you, Dylan. Thank you, Nick. I hope we get you up to Tacoma uh, one of these days very soon when this whole madness is over. Uh, and once again, if you haven't seen In a Silent Way yet, uh, check it out through the Tacoma Film Festival, screening through Thursday. Thanks so much to Tacoma Film Festival's uh, Tanya and David for their help with the uh, Zoom chat tonight. And uh, this has been just a lot of fun for me. Uh, thanks for making a great movie, you guys. Yeah, thanks so much, Abe. Thank we you. appreciate it a lot. Thank you, Gordon. We do also have, there's a couple questions if people have oh, time. Oh, great, yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. Here we go. Chat, Abe. Yeah, I just sent the latest ones to you. All right. Uh, oh, some uh, Claire Malloy says she's a big Nick Tuttle fan. <laughs> wow, that's, that's good to see. It's and uh, ask, uh, we have, uh, oh, uh, what was your favorite thing about playing your character because you got to play Jazzin's nemesis? Um... I honestly, I think it's funny because my character from the beginning had the, like everyone turns on Jazzin at the end of it. My character from the beginning almost did the reverse. He hated him in the beginning and he kind of mellowed out and kind of could see how he could use him near the end. And I thought, 
I thought I like playing. Well, I mean, I just like playing that reverse journey than everyone else. And I just like kind of being the odd man out going into it because I mean, I've been, I, I would, I've improvised tons of, we shot tons of short films with uh, Colin before and that um, routine of improvising with uh, uh, Nikolai uh, who played jazz and was, is just kind of second nature. So I thought that was just some of the most fun. And Nick Kimball is asking how long it took to grow that beautiful mustache or was that acting too? That was acting too. That's as acting as the sax. No that's, way! Uh, that's, a, that's a fake mustache. Yeah. None of, and everything that I did in this film was fake. Wow. Yeah. We really, we really made him up and he did a fantastic job. And I think that's all. Oh, uh, I think we kind of covered that, your favorite scene to film in the movie. Dylan, did you have a favorite scene to film? Um, well, I would say that I think the scenes that were the most fun were the ones um, like the, the stalking scene, but also like when Jazzin goes to Ron's uh, uh, office and tries to hand him the contract. Oh. Oh. Scenes like that are difficult because, again, I have to figure out how to film it without being seen. You know, I have to go through the work of, of putting myself in that place with a camera and I couldn't be seen. So that one, you know, if you rewatch it, you'll see I'm like sort of shooting through bushes and the actors could obviously see me, but I had to make it seem like it's possible that they wouldn't have seen me. <laughs> so it seems that offered those weird kind of conundrums of like, well, why am I here? And how, how, does the, how is the scene affected by my presence being there? Those are always really interesting and fun to figure out. Yeah. And Colin, we'll let you wrap it up. Did you have a favorite scene in, to film? Oh, man. That's tough because obviously, you know, I will say I am in the movie at some point. <laughs> I play drums in Nick, Nick's band. Ah. Um, and I could not keep a straight face in the scene. And... <laughs> It was like, I think, you know, Nikolai may have even gotten a little frustrated because I just saw him yelling at me and I was just laughing and I couldn't help it. And I, you know, that was very fun for me, at least. Uh, I don't know about everybody else. Um, but then I also think the record store scene was very fun to shoot yeah. with everybody blowing up. I mean, that was just like, that's just fun. And they're just running around and it's chaos. And that was like, that we got was half of our crew in that scene too. Yes, that's true. <laughs> yeah, our our, uh, our first AC, Alejandro, I think is one of the record patrons. Oh, our first AD, Sean Bradley, yeah. is behind the record counter. Shout out to those guys. Um, but yeah, that was that was a really fun scene. For and sure. we can't we can't leave Alex out our sound mix. Oh, Alex, oh, our yeah. sound mixer. Yes, of course. He was amazing throughout the whole thing. Yeah, she's the best. Yeah, absolutely. And finally, Sean uh, uh, ch chimes in to say, sup. Yes, Sean Bradley, our, our first King himself. and uh, an executive producer on this film. We couldn't have done it without him. Uh, very, very integral part of the team, for sure. This was a small movie, so everybody who was a part of it, you know, had to do multiple things. And it was sort of like, you know, nobody was like, well, no, I don't do that or whatever. It was just like we, it was very family affair. So, you know, everybody who worked on it, it was, we had a great time. I will say we had a lot of fun and um, I hope that that shows in the movie in some way too, you know, that this truly was a, a really fun experience. And Kimball Farley, who is in this, is I see his writing now, he obviously was a Al bass player in the film. Very great. So yeah, it was really fun. And Lisa London just chimed in to say, so happy to be with the team. Yes. Queen. Yeah, Queen. <laughs> exactly. Thanks again, you fellas. Really yeah, appreciate thanks it. so much, Abe. We appreciate Good movie. it. Thanks a lot. And yeah. uh, Tacoma Film Festival runs through Sunday the 15th. TacomaFilmFestival.com for more info. And In a Silent Way is streaming through November 12th. Get your jazzin' on. Yeah. <laughs> yes, get your jazzin' on. <laughs> thanks, guys. I'm going to blow you away. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, everybody. Have a good one. Bye. Hope to see you again soon. Yes.